Book Third, Chapter First, Parts Four to Six, of Tono Bungay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Tono Bungay by H. G. Wells, Book Third, Chapter First, Parts Four to Six. Four. I pass the Hardingham ever and again and glance aside through the great archway of the fountain and the ferns, and think of those receding days when I was so near the center of our eddy of greed and enterprise. I see again my uncle's face, white and intent, and hear him discourse, hear him make consciously Napoleonic decisions, grip his nettles, put his finger on the spot, bluff, say, snap. He became particularly addicted to the last idiom. Towards the end, every conceivable act took the form of saying, Snap! The odd fish that came to us, and among others came Gordon Nasmith, that queer blend of romance and egality, who was destined to drag me into the most irrelevant adventure in my life, the Mordet Island affair, and leave me, as they say, with blood upon my hands. It is remarkable how little it troubles my conscience, and how much it stirs my imagination, that particular memory of the life I took. The story of Mordet Island has been told in a government report, and told all wrong. There are still excellent reasons for leaving it wrong in places, but the liveliest appeals of discretion forbid my leaving it out altogether. I've still the vividest memory of Gordon Nasmith's appearance in the inner sanctum a lank, sunburnt person in tweeds, with a yellow-brown hatchet face and one faded blue eye. The other was closed and sunken lid, and now he told us with a stiff affectation of ease his incredible story of this great heap of quap that lay abandoned or undiscovered on the beach behind Mordet's Island among white dead mangroves and the black ooze of brackish water. "'What's quap?' said my uncle on the fourth repetition of the word. They call it quap, or quab, or quab, said Gordon Nasmith. But our relations weren't friendly enough to get the accent right. But there's the stuff is for the taking. They don't know about it. Nobody knows about it. I got down to the damned place in a canoe alone. The boys wouldn't come. I pretended to be botanizing. To begin with, Gordon Nasmith was inclined to be dramatic. "'Look here,' he said, when he first came in, shutting the door rather carefully behind him as he spoke. "'Do you two men, yes or no, want to put up six thousand for a clear good chance of fifteen hundred per cent on your money in a year?' "'We're always getting chances like that,' said my uncle, cocking his cigar offensively, wiping his glasses and tilting his chair back. "'We stick to a safe twenty. Gordon Nasmith's quick temper showed in a slight stiffening of his attitude. "'Don't you believe him,' said I, getting up before he could reply. "'You're different, and I know your books. We're very glad you've come to us. Confound it, uncle. It's Gordon Nasmith. Sit down. What is it? Minerals?' "'Quap,' said Gordon Nasmith, fixing his eye on me. "'In heaps.' "'In heaps.' said my uncle softly, with his glasses very oblique. "'You're only fit for the grocery,' said Gordon Nasmith scornfully, sitting down and helping himself to one of my uncle's cigars. "'I'm sorry I came, but still, now I'm here, and first as to quap. Quap, sir, is the most radioactive stuff in the world. That's quap. It's a festering mass of earths and heavy metals. Polonium, radium, ethorium, thorium, carium, and new things, too. There's a stuff called XK, provisionally. There they are, mucked up together in a sort of rotting sand. What it is, how it got made, I don't know. It's like as if some young creator had been playing about there. There it lies in two heaps, one small, one great, and the world for miles about it is blasted and scorched and dead. You can have it for the getting. You've got to take it. That's all. 
"'That sounds all right,' said I. "'Have you samples?' "'Well, should I? "'You can have anything, up to two ounces.' "'Where is it?' "'His blue eye smiled at me and scrutinized me. "'He smoked and was fragmentary for a time, "'fending off my questions. "'Then his story began to piece itself together. "'He conjured up a vision of this strange forgotten kink "'in the world's literal, "'of the long meandering channels that spread and divaricate "'and spend their burden of mud and silt "'within the thunderbelt of Atlantic surf.' of the dense, tangled vegetation that creeps into the shimmering water with root and sucker. He gave a sense of heat and a perpetual reek of vegetable decay, and told how, at last, comes a break among these things, an arena fringed with bone-white dead trees, a sight of the hard blue sea line beyond the dazzling surf, and a wide desolation of dirty shingle and mud, bleached and scarred. A little way off among charred dead weeds stands the abandoned station, abandoned because every man who stayed two months at that station stayed to die eaten up mysteriously like a leper with its dismantled sheds and its decaying pier of worm-rotten and oblique piles and planks still insecurely possible and in the midst two clumsy heaps shaped like the backs of hogs one small one great sticking out under a rib of rock that cuts the space across Quap. "'There it is,' said Gordon Nasmith. "'Worth three pounds an ounce, if it's worth a penny. Two great heaps of it. Rotten stuff and soft, ready to shovel and wheel. And you may get it by the ton.' "'How did it get there?' "'God knows. There it is for the taking, in a country where you mustn't trade, in a country where the company waits for good kind men to find it riches, and then take him away from him. There you have it. Derelict.' "'Can't you do any sort of deal?' "'They're too damn stupid. You've got to go and take it. That's all.' "'They might catch you.' "'They might, of course, but they're not great at catching.' We went into the particulars of that difficulty. "'They wouldn't catch me because I'd sink first. "'Give me a yacht,' said Gordon Nasmith. "'That's all I need.' "'But if you get caught,' said my uncle.' i am inclined to think gordon nasmith imagined we would give him a check for six thousand pounds on the strength of his talk it was very good talk but we didn't do that i stipulated for samples and his stuff for analysis and he consented reluctantly i think on the whole he would rather i didn't examine samples he made a motion pocket words that gave us an invincible persuasion that he had a sample upon him, and that, at the last instant, he decided not to produce it prematurely. There was evidently a curious strain of secretiveness in him. He didn't like to give us samples, and he wouldn't indicate within three hundred miles the position of this Mordet island of his. He had it clear in his mind that he had a secret of immense value, and he had no idea at all of just how far he ought to go with business people. And so presently, to gain time for these hesitations of his, he began to talk of other things. He talked very well. He talked of the Dutch East Indies and of the Congo, of Portuguese East Africa and Paraguay, of Malays and rich Chinese merchants. Dyaks and Negroes and the spread of the Mahometan world in Africa today. And all this time he was trying to judge if we were good enough to trust with his adventure. Our cozy inner office became a little place, and all our business cold and lifeless exploits beside his glimpses of strange minglings of men, of slayings unavenged and curious customs, of trade where no writs run and the dark treacheries of eastern ports and uncharted channels. We had neither of us gone abroad except for a few vulgar raids on Paris. Our world was England, and the places of origin of half the raw material of the goods we sold had seemed to us as remote as fairyland or the forest of Arden. But Gordon Nasmith made it so real and intimate for us that afternoon, for me at any rate, that it seemed like something seen and forgotten and now again remembered. And in the end he produced his sample, a little lump of muddy clay speckled with brownish grains, in a glass bottle wrapped about with lead and flannel, 
red flannel it was, I remember, a hue which is, I know, popularly supposed to double all the mystical efficacies of flannel. Don't carry it about on you, said Gordon Nasmith. It makes a sore. I took the stuff to Thorold, and Thorold had the exquisite agony of discovering two new elements in what was then a confidential analysis. He has christened them and published since, but at the time Gordon Nasmith wouldn't hear for a moment of our publication of any facts at all. Indeed, he flew into a violent passion and abused me mercilessly, even for showing the stuff to Thorold. "'I thought you were going to analyze it yourself,' he said, with a touching persuasion of the layman that a scientific man knows and practices at the sciences. I made some commercial inquiries, and there seemed, even then, much truth in Gordon Nasmith's estimate of the value of the stuff. It was before the days of Capern's discovery of the value of canadium and his use of it in the Capern filament. But the cerium and thorium alone were worthy the money he extracted for the gas mantles then in vogue. There were, however, doubts. Indeed, there were numerous doubts. What were the limits of the gas mantle trade? How much thorium, not to speak of cerium, could they take at a maximum? Suppose that quantity was high enough to justify our shipload. Came doubts in another quarter. Were the heaps up to sample? Were they as big as he said? Was Gordon Nasmith imaginative? And if these values held, could we, after all, get the stuff? It wasn't ours. It was on forbidden ground. You see, there were doubts of every grade and class in the way of this adventure. We went some way, nevertheless, in the discussion of his project, though I think we tried his patience. Then, suddenly, he vanished from London, and I saw no more of him for a year and a half. My uncle said that was what he had expected, and when at last Gordon Nasmith reappeared, and mentioned in an incidental way that he had been to Paraguay on private, and we guessed passionate, affairs, the business of the Quap expedition had to be begun again at the beginning. My uncle was disposed to be altogether skeptical, but I wasn't so decided. I think I was drawn by its picturesque aspects but we neither of us dreamt of touching it seriously until Capern's discovery. Nasmith's story had laid hold of my imagination like one small, intense picture of tropical sunshine hung on a wall of grey business affairs. I kept it going during Gordon Nasmith's intermittent appearances in England. Every now and then he and I would meet and reinforce its effect. We would lunch in London, or he would come to see my gliders at Crest Hill, and make new projects for getting at those heaps again, now with me, now alone. At times they became a sort of fairy story with us, an imaginative exercise, and there came Capern's discovery of what he called the ideal filament, and with it an altogether less problematical quality about the business side of Quap. For the ideal filament needed 5% of canadium, and canadium was known to the world only as a newly separated constituent of a variety of the rare mineral rutile. But to Thorold it was better known as an element in a mysterious sample brought to him by me, and to me it was known as one of the elements in Quap. I told my uncle, and we jumped on to the process at once. We found that Gordon Nasmith, still unaware of the altered value of the stuff, and still thinking of the experimental prices of radium and the rarity value of cerium, had got hold of a cousin named Polak, made some extraordinary transaction about his life insurance policy, and was buying a brig. We put in, put down three thousand pounds, and forthwith the life insurance transaction and the Polak side of this finance vanished into thin air leaving Polak, I regret to say, in the brig and in the secret, except so far as canadium and the filament went, as residuum. We discussed earnestly whether we should charter a steamer or go on with the brig, but we decided on the brig as a less conspicuous instrument for an enterprise that was, after all, to put it plainly, stealing. But that was one of our last enterprises before our great crisis, and I will tell of it in its place. So it was Quap came into our affairs, came in as a fairy tale, and became real. 
More and more real it grew, until at last it was real, until at last I saw with my eyes the heaps my imagination had seen for so long, and felt between my fingers again that half-gritty, half-soft texture of quap, like sanded moist sugar mixed with clay in which there stirs something. One must feel it to understand. 5. All sorts of things came to the Hardingham, and offered themselves to my uncle. Gordon Nasmyth stands but only because he played a part at last in the crisis of our fortunes. So much came to us that it seemed to me at times as though the whole world of human affairs was ready to prostitute itself to our real and imaginary millions. As I look back, I am still dazzled and incredulous to think of the quality of our opportunities. We did the most extraordinary things things that it seems absurd to me to leave to any casual man of wealth and enterprise who cares to do them. I had some amazing perceptions of just how modern thought and the supply of fact to the general mind may be controlled by money. Among other things that my uncle offered for, he tried very hard to buy the British Medical Journal and the Lancet, and run them on what he called modern lines and when they resisted him, he talked very vigorously for a time of organizing a rival enterprise. That was a very magnificent idea, indeed, in its way. It would have given a tremendous advantage in the handling of innumerable specialties, and indeed, I scarcely know how far it would not have put the medical profession in our grip. It still amazes me, I shall die amazed, that such a thing can be possible in the modern state. If my uncle failed to bring the thing off, someone else may succeed. But I doubt, even if he had got both these weeklies, whether his peculiar style would have suited them. The change of purpose would have shown. He would have found it difficult to keep up their dignity. He certainly did not keep up the dignity of the sacred grove, an important critical organ which he acquired one day by saying snap for eight hundred pounds. He got it, lock, stock, and barrel, under one or other of which three aspects the editor was included. Even at that price, it didn't pay. If you are a literary person, you will remember the bright new cover he gave that representative organ of British intellectual culture, and how his sound business instincts jarred with the exalted pretensions of a vanished age. One old rapper I discovered the other day runs, The Sacred Grove, Weekly Magazine of Art, Philosophy, Science, and Belles Lettres. Have you a nasty taste in your mouth? It is liver. You need one twenty-three pill. Just one. Not a drug, but a live American remedy. Contents. A hitherto unpublished letter from Walter Pater, Charlotte Bronte's maternal great-aunt. A new Catholic history of England. The genius of Shakespeare correspondence, the Mendelian hypothesis, the split infinitive, commence or begin, clever house, socialism and the individual, the dignity of letters, folklore gossip, the stage, the paradox of acting, travel, biography, verse, fiction, etc. The best pill in the world for an irregular liver. I suppose it is some lingering traces of the blades over tradition to me that makes this combination of letters and pills seem so incongruous. Just as I suppose it is a lingering trace of Plutarch and my ineradicable boyish imagination that at bottom our state should be wise, sane, and dignified that makes me think a country which leaves its medical and literary criticism or indeed any such vitally important criticism, entirely to private enterprise, and open to the advances of any purchaser, must be in a frankly hopeless condition. These are ideal conceptions of mine. As a matter of fact, nothing would be more entirely natural and representative of the relations of learning, thought, and the economic situation in the world at the present time than this cover of the sacred grove. The quiet conservatism of the one element embedded in the aggressive brilliance of the other, the contrasted notes of bold physiological experiment and extreme mental immobility. 6. There comes back, too, among these Hardingham memories, an impression of a drizzling November day, 
and how he looked out of the windows upon a procession of the London unemployed. It was like looking down a well into some momentarily revealed netherworld. Some thousands of needy, ineffectual men had been raked together to trail their spiritless misery through the West Eyre with an appeal that was also, in its way, a weak and insubstantial threat. It is work we need, not charity. There they were, half phantom through the fog, a silent, foot-dragging, interminable grey procession. They carried wet, dirty banners. They rattled boxes for pence. These men, who had not said snap in the right place, the men who had snapped too eagerly, the men who had never said snap, the men who had never had a chance of saying snap. A shambling, shameful stream they made, oozing along the street, the gutter waste of competitive civilization. And we stood high out of it all, as high as if we looked godlike from another world, standing in a room beautifully lit and furnished, skillfully warmed, filled with costly things. There, thought I, but for the grace of God, go George and Edward Ponderevo. But my uncle's thoughts ran in a different channel, and he made that vision the test of a spirited but inconclusive harangue upon tariff reform. End of Book Third, Chapter First, Parts Four to Six Recording by William Tomko.